Well, one of the phrases that I really enjoy is this short phrase that says, expect the unexpected, right? Uh, so there's something about a surprise, something just crossing your path that you didn't see coming. Now, granted, sometimes it can be really scary things, but, but normally when I see things like this, it, it's invigorating. It, it, it kind of helps me sit up in my chair and be more alert. For, for example, a couple of weeks ago, I went on a hike, one of our trails up here, and it's one where you climbed more than I thought I was going to. I was realizing how out of shape I was, but I was huffing and puffing up this hill, and I turned the corner. It's the Hidden Valley Overlook, by the way. If you know that trail, some of you are saying, wimp, you shouldn't have to huff and puff on that one, but I was, but I, you're, you're, you're climbing. I don't know, 3,000 feet maybe above sea level, who knows. But what was unexpected, I rounded the corner, and there, blocking the path, were like six or seven of these huge cows. I did not expect to climb up on the top of a mountain and find cows. But here's the problem. The end of the trail is over there. I'm here, and in between me and there is this massive bovine impediment that I have to navigate. Well, I won't get into the story, but I made it there and back, and all the cows were fine, so we survived. But my point is, those are the things, these unexpected things that you look and say, wow, that's the story. I mean, if I told you I went on this hike and it was hard and I was breathing heavy, and then I came back to my car, that's not a story. But if I'm on this hike and suddenly there are these cows, honestly, my first thought was beef. It's what's for dinner. <laughs> Didn't go there, though. <laughs> but that's the story, right? This is the stuff, and if, you, you know, if you're friends with me on Facebook, you know this. These are the things we take pictures of and post on social media, right? Because that's the story. That's the excitement. My point is, we're, we've been looking at a couple of parables from Jesus, and when you come to the parables, here's the key, expect the unexpected. You, you want to see things in the story. This is really where you kind of look for the truth in these parables. Or, or, or where's the twist? Where's the plot twist? Where, where are the things that we don't expect to see in this story? And these were great. I mean, Jesus tells a story about the man who was beaten and left for dead. Remember, the priest and the Levite cross on the other side of the street, and they leave him there. And then here comes a Samaritan, the hated Samaritans. And if you're hearing the story the first time, you're thinking, this guy's going to finish him off. But then the unexpected twist, right? The Samaritan is the good Samaritan who stops and helps. And for the first listeners to this story, it's like, well, I didn't see that coming. It's expect the unexpected. The prodigal son who takes half of his father's, or a third rather, of, of his father's wealth, and he, he goes off and squanders it. And then he comes dragging his tail back. Here's the unexpected part. The father has been watching for him. And he hikes up his clothes and goes sprinting down the dusty trail to welcome home his son. You, you didn't see that coming. And, and these are parables. You expect the unexpected. And that is so true in the story we're going to look at today, the parable that Jesus told. It starts off as a common story. There's a man who's throwing a great banquet, so he invited lots of people. That's not surprising. But then these people who agreed to come, instead of coming, made these lame excuses, and no one showed up at the banquet. That's unexpected. And as we go through this story, we're going to see just a series of unexpected things that happen. This whole story is based on the unexpected. The invited become the excluded, the neglected become the included, and all the outsiders become insiders. Nothing in this story happens the way it's supposed to. And I think the key point of the story is this, that the kingdom of God is filled with unexpected guests. Now, when I say unexpected guests, some of you that are into entertaining kind of uh, have an anxiety attack because we think of unexpected guests as like you plan a party for 12 and then, you know, 25 show up and you're scrambling for more chairs and more food. 
I don't mean unexpected guests in that way. What I mean is that the guests at the feast that God is throwing are unexpected. They're not the people you would expect to be there. And the kingdom of God is filled with these unexpected guests. By the way, when Jesus tells a story about a feast, he's telling a story that these Pharisees would have been very familiar with. Because back in Isaiah chapter 25, there's a, a prophecy of a great feast that God is going to throw. And it's talking about the other side of eternity. And at this great table of the Lord will be people from every nation. Jews and Gentiles will be there together enjoying this feast from the Lord. And I love how Jesus is sitting at this table with the Pharisees. And he points them to that table, the one that's coming. And these were experts on the law. They would have known this, this prophetic word. And Jesus is using this occasion at this table to point to that table and give them this truth. That the kingdom of God, the people sitting around that table, will be filled with unexpected guests. Not the ones you think are the, the ones who were invited but the unexpected guests. So let's see this together. I, I want to begin by just going back and reviewing a little bit to, to set the stage for, for where, for the context of this story. Then we're going to start working through the story. But the context, and we've been here for the last three weeks, it's all happened around one table. It, it's Jesus who's on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way to the cross. And he stops in this village, probably teaches at the, the synagogue. It's a Sabbath day. And he, he's invited to the home of a ruler of the Pharisees. This is an important Pharisee. And normally what would happen is you would fill the table with other dignitaries, other leaders, other important people. Culturally, we, 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 we know that it, it was common, these types of, uh, of, of events, these types of meals, to allow people from the community to come in and, and not sit at the table, but just sit along the walls. So sit on the floor on the wall, or maybe even spill out into the courtyard so, so they could hear what was going on. Now, we, we don't read that necessarily in this context, but it's interesting to think that, that this may have been the setting for this. And we read that these Pharisees were watching Jesus carefully. They were lurking, waiting for him to make a, a misstatement or, or mess up somewhere so they could accuse him. Well, this meal becomes a very confrontational meal. There are three ways Jesus confronts these Pharisees. First, he, he accuses them of being legalistic, and here's how he does it. There's a man there with, with dropsy who's, who's swollen and bloated, and, and Jesus, before he heals him, confronts them about, you have all these barriers that you erect that, that keep you from showing kindness to this person. I mean, you look and say, it's the Sabbath. We can't help today. Come back tomorrow. You're unclean. I can't touch you. You have all these rules that keep you from showing kindness, but instead of these barriers, Jesus builds a bridge of compassion. And he shows that showing compassion is, 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 is more important than these legalistic barriers that you've built. So he confronts them for being legalistic. Then he confronts them for being proud. When you come to these meals, you scramble for the best seats. Don't do that. Sit in the worst seats. Sit at the kids' table. And let someone come and say, you don't belong at the kids' table. Come sit over here. You, you know, you go back to the kids' table. Let someone else exalt you instead of exalting yourself. Here's, here's, here's his point. It's better to humble yourself and let God exalt you than for you to exalt yourself and let God humble you. But you're proud. His third confrontation is that you are exclusive. When you throw these feasts... It's only for each other. You only invite people to dinner that will benefit you. So instead of inviting your, your friends, your relatives, your rich neighbors, who you know are going to in turn invite you to their house, do something radical. Instead of excluding the poor and the lame, invite them to your feast. Oh, and you'll be blessed. 
You'll be blessed because they can't repay you. But you'll be rewarded at the resurrection of the just. And, and this one Pharisee is listening to this. And I, this, this guy's one of my favorite Pharisees in all of the New Testament, and I'll tell you why in a second. He's hearing, I mean, Jesus has just blasted them, right? You are legalistic, you are proud, and you're exclusive. And this guy responds, I love this. He responds by coming to them and saying, when one of those who reclined at the table heard him say these things, he said to him, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Isn't that awesome? Here's what I mean by this. Jesus has just said, if you invite the poor, you will be blessed at the resurrection. And this guy says, well, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. I like this guy because he's one of these optimist, positivity kind of people. I mean, there's a bit of a continuum, right? There's an Eeyore on this side, okay? And then you come to this extreme, and you've got Tigger, right? And everyone is somewhere between Eeyore and Tigger. And this guy is a Tigger. He's a, how many of you know someone like the glass is always at least half full? They see the bright side of everything. Do you know someone like that? A few of you. How many of you are annoyed by people like that? I, I, I say that because I, I tend to be one of these Tigger kinds of people, and I've been told that it can be annoying. I mean, this is the kind of person that, like, you, you walk in, you know, to a hospital room, and, and, you know, you see this in cartoons where the guy's, like, in a complete body cast, and all that's showing is, like, right here, and everything else is in a cast. And, the, you know, this is the person that will walk in and say, whoa, at least you didn't break your nose. That'd be horrible. You know, you know it's, it's, it's always, well, at least it wasn't this bad, or, or, you know, it could have been worse. This is the positive. So here's this guy. Jesus is blasting them. You guys are legalistic. You are proud. You're exclusive. And this guy is basically saying, hey, at least we're going to heaven. I mean, that's what he's saying. But how happy is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of heaven? We may be exclusive and proud and legalistic, but we're going to... It's interesting to think through when he said this statement. When he said, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of heaven. Who did he think that included? It's interesting because you can read some of the, the writings. I, I, I've taught this passage many times, but this was, this was a new discovery for me this week, and I love this. But because you can read some writings from the first century from the Jews, and it's amazing how they had misunderstood Isaiah's prophecy of saying there's going to be a great feast and people from every nation is going to be there. there, there there's one writing that looks at that prophecy because this helps us understand what they're thinking at this table. There's, there's one prophecy that says the Gentiles are going to be there, but at that time, God is going to unleash plagues on the Gentiles that they cannot escape, that this feast is going to be a place of judgment for the Gentiles. Another writer would, would, would go on to say that they will be gathered there as the Jews and Gentiles at this feast, but God will send the, the, the death angel to, to judge the Gentiles. There are some more writings that were uh, with the Qumran community, if you're familiar with Dead Sea Scrolls and all that, but, but in some of their writings, we, we, we read in there some of the similar things about this being a time of judgment for the Gentiles, but also in there that there will be no one there who has any imperfection, any, any blemish, any visible disability, the blind, the lame, the crippled. They will not be at this feast, but only those who have kept the law, who have lived by the law. The Jews who have lived in obedience and are free from physical defects or deformities. That's how they understood this Isaiah prophecy. And, and when, when this Pharisee is saying, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about the people sitting around the table. He's not talking about the Gentiles. He's not talking about the blind and the lame, the crippled. He's not talking about people that could have been sitting in the same room 
along the walls. Blessed are we. We might be legalistic. We might be proud. We might be exclusive. But we are the ones who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. So Jesus responds. I mean, Jesus could have just blasted them again, right? You are so wrong. Don't you see that your legalism and your pride and your exclusivity is condemning you and that the only way for you to have entrance into the kingdom of God is to trust me and to follow me? He could have confronted them like that, but as Jesus so often did, he responds with a story. There was a man. He threw a great banquet and invited many. And then when the feast was ready, he sent his servant, go, go tell everyone. The preparations are made. Come to the table. It, you know, it, it's a bit of, we use the word a double invitation. In, in some ways, it's, it's different than our culture, but in a lot of ways, it's pretty similar. It's a double invitation of saying, I've invited people and they've RSVP'd. They're going to come. They've told me they're coming. So we're making arrangements for these people that have told me they're coming. And then when everything's ready, I send the servant out or I ring the dinner bell and I say, okay, it's ready. Come to the table. I mean, we, we had this growing up. We would come home from church and we loved having a, a family meal together after church and would come home and, you know, my, my parents were finishing getting the food ready and then it was my dad's role to come up and gather the kids because food's ready and so we know we're invited, but then when it's ready, we have this other invitation to come. It's a double invitation. Or, or imagine you do get invited to this beautiful home for lunch or, or for an evening meal. And, there, you know, it's an exclusive thing, and you're so honored to have been invited. And when you get there, everyone kind of starts mingling around. Maybe there's, there might even be appetizers or hors d'oeuvres outside, and you're enjoying just mingling around. And then at some point, someone's going to say, hey, let's come sit at the table. What you expect people to do on this second invitation is to come sit at the table. But remember, this is a parable, and we learn to expect the unexpected, right? And so instead of coming to the table to enjoy this great feast, we start hearing these excuses. This is the unexpected part. No one comes to the table. They all alike, every one of them, had excuses. Let's, let's pick up and read those excuses again. But they all began to make excuses. I have bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. I must go examine them. Please have me excused. And another said... I just got married, and therefore I cannot come. Okay, th these excuses, this is another unexpected part because they are so ridiculous. This is the comic relief of the story. Jesus included the most bizarre excuses that no one would ever use in real life. Because they're ridiculous. Let, let, let me notice a couple of things. These excuses, first of all, they're just lame. These are lame excuses. You, you've agreed to come to this. It's on your calendar. Come to the table. Everything's ready. Oh, ha, you know what? I just bought a field, some property, and I've got to go look at it. Does something seem out of order here? Usually, you look at the field <laughs> and the property, and then you buy it. By the way, especially in a Middle Eastern setting where most of it is desert and not all of it is rich for farming, you're not just going to go buy a property sight unseen. Much less would you go out and buy five yoke of oxen. I mean, this guy was wealthy. Not only could he afford 10 oxen, but he had land big enough that he needed multiple oxen to plow his land. He was also a man that was probably wealthy enough to have servants to go check on all these things, but he decides right now, when the food's ready, 
that he needs to go look at these oxen. It's kind of like, you know, would you buy a used car without looking at it? Probably not. And then this other guy that doesn't even ask to be excused. You know, surprise, I got married. <laughs> I have a new wife, so I can't come. You know, we're, we're, we've got this new thing we're going to binge watch on Netflix tonight. And so, yeah, we, we just can't make it to the feast. They're, 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 they're lame. These are not good excuses. Not only are they lame, they are inherently selfish. I know you've gone to these preparations and you've prepared all this food, but this is what I want to do. I need to go look at this property. I need to go look at these oxen. I want a night home with, with my new bride, giving no thought to the master or his generosity. I also notice these three excuses are really distractions. I mean, they've been invited to this great banquet, this great feast, but they miss it. They miss it because they would rather look at oxen than enjoy the generosity, the hospitality of this great feast. And and I say that because as Jesus is looking at these men around the table, and he's painting this picture. He, remember, he's sitting at this table, but talking about that table. And he's pointing the picture that there's a kingdom of God. You are the first invited, but you're missing it because you're not trusting in me. You're not following me. Instead, you're trying to trap me and accuse me. You're missing the whole point. And, and it's important because not only were they invited to the feast, but each of us have also been invited to the feast. There's this invitation that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And many in this room have heard the gospel message and responded and said, yes, Jesus, I want to follow you. But there may be some in this room who have heard the message of the gospel, this message that says that because of our sin, we are separated from God. And we live in a broken world, and our only hope for being made right with God is that God sent His Son, Jesus, fully God, fully man, to die on the cross in our place as our substitute. And as we trust Him, as we place our faith in Him, then our sins are forgiven, we are adopted into His family, we can feast at the table of the Lord. And all that's required of us is to trust Christ, to follow Him. And there may be some who have heard this message and you've never responded by giving your life to Jesus. And you may have a whole list of reasons, a whole list of excuses for why you have not surrendered your heart to follow Jesus. And I just can't help but think that one day we're going to stand before the Lord. We're going to come face to face with the one who died for us. And we're going to look at the the nail prints on his feet and on his hands. And whatever excuse we had for not trusting Christ is going to feel really lame at that point. And I can't help but think that maybe selfishness, things that we don't want to change in our life, things that we don't want to let go of, prevent us from entering the kingdom of heaven. Or maybe we're just too distracted by things we need to look at and explore that we don't pause and consider the invitation that we have been given to follow Christ. You see, this is not just about these men sitting around the table. This is about each of us and our need to respond to the gospel given to us through Jesus. And and notice what happens. Notice the response here of the master. So the servant came and reported these things to his master, then the master of the house became angry. And and, and I read this, I say, well, it's hard to blame him for being angry at this point. Everyone said they're coming, but they have lame excuses and no one shows up. And and, and then as he, I I, I picture a wedding when I think of this, because this is the setting we have where we agonize over a guest list who to invite, who to not to invite, and we invite people, and they say they're coming. And can you imagine all the work you put into a wedding, and you get to the wedding day, and absolutely no one showed up? Can you imagine the bride walking down the aisle, and there's no one sitting in the chairs? I get this. The master 
at this point was angry that he invited all these people and no one came. Here's the biggest unexpected thing, though. What would you expect a master to do when he's angry? Look what he does. The master became angry. And here's the unexpected. He said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done, and there is still room. And the master said to his servant, Go out to the highways and hedges. Compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. Here's the biggest unexpected part of this story, and this is where we get a glimpse of the heart of God, that when the master was angry, he showed grace. You don't expect that. What's the heart of God? It's just overflowing with grace. And I love this picture. Servant, go quickly and go into the streets and the alleys and the lanes of the city and look for those people sitting on the side of the roads, the one holding their cup, begging for money. Find the poor and the crippled, the, 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 the blind, the lame. And notice what it says. Don't just invite these people. It says bring these people because you can't come to this crippled man sitting on the side of the road begging and say, hey, there's a great feast by this really rich guy in the big house down the road. He wants you to come. So if you could just kind of drag yourself all the way across town, you're welcome to be there. Or you can't come to the blind guy and say there's a feast. You know the really big house, the white one with the blue shutters? He doesn't get that. If he's going to get there, you need to bring him to the feast. And I just can't help but Picture, you know, you start out the day like every other day. You, you, you have someone bring you and sit you by the road. Anyone comes by, can you spare a coin? And then you've got this servant saying, are you kidding? A coin? Have I got a deal for you? There's a feast. More food than you've ever eaten. The richest food you've ever tasted. And you can come at absolutely no cost because this master is this awesome, generous guy who shows grace and generous hospitality. And I'm not only going to tell you about it, I'm going to bring you there so you can taste this. Or this poor guy who's saying, I don't know if I can feed my family this week. And the servant comes and says, well, bring your whole family and eat all you can because this is amazing food. And I just picture these people sitting around the table. This is amazing. What is that stuff? I think they call it gravy. We've never been able to afford this, but you put it on your biscuits and it's really good. <laughs> Try the gray stuff. It's delicious. I mean, everything about this is just filled with joy of people who haven't been able to experience these things that are now feasting because of the grace of the master. But there's only one problem. The one problem is that there are still some empty seats. So he tells his servant, okay, now leave the city. Go out into the highways, the hedges. Go, go find people. And this time it doesn't say to bring them. It says compel them to come. Why would you have to compel people to come to this great feast? Because they don't yet know the master. They don't know that here's this wealthy guy with this big house that is just overflowing with grace and generosity and hospitality, and he's throwing this crazy party, and you are invited. You don't know him, so I'm going to talk you into, here's why you need to come, and I'm going to compel you to come join this feast. And so here you have this great banquet. Those who were invited are now excluded. Those who were neglected are now included. All of the outsiders have become insiders. Expect the unexpected. And look how Jesus wraps this up. He said, for I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. It's really interesting because when you read it, it, it sounds like this is still the master speaking to his servant. Go out in the highways and byways and the hedges, compel them to come. For I tell you, none of those first invited We'll taste of my banquet. But what's interesting is there's a subtle shift here. The word you, for I tell you, is plural. It's what I like to call the Greek word y'all. Okay? 
And so notice this change. Like the, the, the master would not say to his servant, I tell y'all. He would say, I tell you. But Jesus, as he's speaking to the Pharisees, would say, I tell y'all who think you'll be the only ones at the feast. None of those who were invited will eat bread at my dinner, at my banquet. Jesus is now putting himself at the place of the host, the one who is extending great grace, the one who is inviting, the one who is welcoming, the one who is showing generous hospitality. So the story started with this poor Tigger Pharisee. (laughs) At least we're going to heaven. We'll be the ones eating bread in the kingdom of God. And Jesus is basically saying, are you sure? You're condemned by your sin. And by the way, don't miss this. We talk about the inviting heart of God. These Pharisees were invited. They were not excluded from the feast but by, because they weren't invited, they were excluded because they refused to follow Jesus. Look what we see of the heart of God in this passage. He is inviting. He is welcoming. He is overflowing with grace. He is showing generous hospitality. It is a feast. And I love this picture. When you think of the actual feast of God, that will be filled with, with unexpected guests, that you have the poor and the lame and the blind, but you know what? They're no longer poor. They're no longer lame. They're no longer blind, but they are joint heirs with Jesus, and they have been made whole in the presence of God. And it's filled with people who are out on the highways and byways. The the Bible says it this way, the people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. This is the feast. So this is the heart of God. And we extend this to others basically by looking at the servant. What does the servant do? He goes, he invites, he brings, he compels. And in this story, we are invited to be a part of the feast, but we bring others with us to the feast. So the joy of being included. And and, and by the way, I love the, the role of the servant. It's like he's got this golden ticket. I can offer you all kinds of great food, and do you know what? It's costing me nothing. I just have to invite you to go. Are you poor? Hey, go eat some food. You're blind? Let me take you there. That's our role as Christ followers, right? Just to point people to Jesus and invite them to this feast. Here's what we see. When we look at this passage, we see that we need to build bridges of compassion instead of barriers of legalism. We need to look beyond ourselves and include others. And we need to be welcoming and inviting, extending the grace of God, extending this generous hospitality with an understanding that the kingdom of God is filled with unexpected guests. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word this morning. This is such a powerful story, such a great passage. And Father, I pray this morning, if there's anyone here that maybe instead of responding to your gospel to this point in their lives, they've, they've only been able to offer excuses. And Father, I pray that even in, in the quietness of this morning that we might be willing to humble our hearts and just come before you and acknowledge, Father God, that we have sinned. And because of our sin, we stand in need of forgiveness. We stand separated from you. But you sent your Son to die in our place and by responding in faith, just coming before you and acknowledging our sin and asking for your forgiveness and a desire to live for you and a faith in Jesus Christ, then we can be made whole. We can be forgiven and have new life in Jesus Christ. Father, if there's anyone who needs to take that step this morning, would you give them the courage to do that? Father, thank you for your generous, welcoming, inviting, grace-filled, hospitable heart that we can catch a glimpse of and extend to others. And may we do this for your glory, and for the good of people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We'll invite us just to come up front to us, collect today's offering.